Well, good evening, Team Grace. How's everybody doing? So, you know, I'm going to ask you on a scale of 1 to 10, how many 10s do we have? Wow, that's great. How many 9 8s? 7 6. And a 5 under, just find someone and get a hug, okay? It's going to be okay. So, good. Well, I'm glad everybody's here this evening. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. May you open our minds that we might receive all the instruction you desire to give us. May you provoke our hearts that we will do all gen generously all that you ask of us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so just some reminders. Next week we don't have faith formation. So next week uh, all the priests are away with the bishop for the annual convocation, and we're having a lot of work being done on that, those hills that are right here in front of our, the entrance of our church building. So, so the campus is gonna be closed, so no faith formation. And again, you're gonna cry, aren't you? I know, it's okay, it's okay. But we will see you all the following week, February 15th. So not this coming Wednesday, but two weeks from now, we're back in session. Sound good? So let me ask you, what is that back wall called? And the red lights that are next to the tabernacle, what are those called? All right, good, good, good. What is the cup called that we use at Mass? What about the plate? What's that called? What about the patent that's used for the distribution of Holy Communion? What's that called? Exactly, that kind of makes sense, right? What about the placemat that's in front of the priest during the Eucharistic sacrifice? What's that called? Corporal. Everybody say it. Corporal. One more time. Corporal. All right, so now let me introduce you to some, some other things. There is a veil that the priest or deacon wears over his shoulders, especially whenever the priest or deacon is around the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass. So it's worn over his shoulders, and therefore it's called a humeral veil, because humeral comes from the Latin word for shoulders, right? So the humeral veil, what's it called? Humeral veil. So that's just, if you see that thing, that long veil that the priest wears over his shoulders, whenever he's carrying or holding the Blessed Sacrament, that's called the what? Humeral veil. All right, now, the sacred vessel that's used whenever we have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, whenever we have adoration, the sacred vessel that's used that's what holds the Blessed Sacrament so we can see it, it's called a monstrance. What's that called? Because the Latin word, remonstrare, means to see, right? So that sacred vessel is called what? What's the veil called? What is the cup called? What's the placemat called? What's the veil called? What is the sacred vessel for the Blessed Sacrament called? Isn't it fun being Catholic? All this in heaven too, huh? All right, go and open up your Credo Missiles to page 46, 47. And we are slowly walking through the whole process for adoration. So whenever we start adoration, what song, what sacred hymn do we sing? The O Salutaris. And as Catholics, whenever we start to sing the O Salutaris, what posture do we take? And then once the priest or deacon opens the tabernacle, what posture do we take? Could that happen right in the middle of the, of the hymn? In fact, most of the time, exactly. So you're singing the O Salutaris and you're watching, and as soon as the tabernacle is open, we kneel, right? And then after the O Salutaris, that's when we have time for adoration. And sometimes people say, well, what do I do during adoration? Well, you pray, you pray. There's no set thing you have to do during adoration. Sometimes people say, like on First Friday, why well, haven't signed up because I don't know what to do. You can do whatever you want, right? So you can bring stuff to read. You can just pray from your heart. You can say or do whatever you want. There's no set format. Sometimes as Catholics, we think, well, there's got to be kind of a rule or a structure to, e to everything. There must be some type of rule or structure to adoration. There's not. It's not. It's one of the few times as a church we're like, relax, right? You just have your prayer time. So someone says, well, pray. I don't know what to do to pray. What am I supposed to do? It's like, well, do what we do best as fallen human beings. Complain, right? <laughs> yeah? 
because you always complain to the people that you know love you, right? You don't go to your worst enemy to complain, do you? It's like that person will never take your side, right? You go to the people you love that you trust. So you can just open up your heart and say, this person's been mean to me at school, and my parents this, and this person that, and so on. You know, I can't believe my hair. Why did I get a zit on this day? Or whatever. I don't know, right? <laughs> whatever young people, you know, or older people, right? Whatever's on our heart. We just talk, and it's a time for prayer. So there's adoration. How does adoration end? What sacred hymn concludes adoration? And we start to sing the Tantum Merga. What posture do we take? Kneel. Kneel. Exactly. So as soon as the priest or deacon or the cantor begins the Tantum Merga, we kneel. Now, that's important because sometimes it can get thrown off because all of a sudden the priest or deacon's walking in and normally when a priest or deacon walks in, you stand. So sometimes people think, oh, it's time to stand. But there's someone greater than a priest or deacon, right? The Lord Jesus is there, solemnly exposed. So he wins, right? So do we stand or do we kneel? kneel. We kneel for the tantum ergo. And then after the tantum ergo, let's go and look at our prayers. So look there in your missiles at the end of the tantum ergo. And I, again, warn some of our older Catholics that the translations have changed so inadvertently, we can accidentally give the wrong response. So after the tantum ergo, there on page 47, the priest or deacon will say, you have given them bread from heaven. And what do you say? Have you all sins? Yep, that's the translation there. And there was an older translation. Sometimes I don't understand why the church changes it just enough to confuse you, right? So the priest says, or deacon, you have given them bread from heaven. What do you say? And then the priest or deacon says, let us pray. And then there's a prayer. And then the priest or deacon says, amen. Now at this point, if he's not already wearing the humeral veil, that's when the priest or deacon is given the humeral veil. Now if he has a server, the humeral veil is given to him. But if there's going to be no server, he'll process in wearing the humeral veil. Right? What's that called again? Humeral. And it's placed over the what? Humeral. And humeral comes from the Latin word for what? I tell you, you can't miss it, right? So then after he says the prayer, the priest or deacon will stand, will genuflect, go up to the altar, genuflect again. Why is he genuflecting so much? Exactly, he's in the presence of God, right? It's like, oh, I am not worthy, right? So he goes up a second time to genuflect, and then he picks up the monstrance. What's that called again? And then he turns around and he gives the benediction with the Blessed Sacrament. So it's a special blessing, a benediction with the Blessed Sacrament. And oftentimes people will say, I don't know what to do during the benediction. Do I make the sign of the cross? Do I? Sometimes it's really slow, right? It's like, do I make three signs of the crosses and so on? Get this. You can make no sign of the cross. Just bow your head and receive the blessing. You can bless yourself once. If you really want to just go for it, you can bless yourself three times. It doesn't matter. At that point, the church will allow you to do whatever you want. Huh? So for myself, I've always been taught you just reverently you know, bow your head and receive the blessing. So I was never taught to make the sign of the cross. But some of you might have been. Or some of you might have been told to bless yourself three times. It doesn't matter. The big thing is Jesus Christ, truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, is blessing you. Okay, after the benediction, then the priest turns and begins to put, prepare the Blessed Sacrament to be reposed. And that's when he starts, look at that there, the divine praises. Now listen, the priest relies, or the deacon relies on you knowing the divine praises. Because at that point, he's doing some other work. He's got to take care of the Blessed Sacrament. So he starts the divine praises, and you're supposed to just keep 14 declarations. Blessed be, blessed be, blessed be, blessed be. You're just so filled with praise and thanks because you just were blessed by God. So the divine praises are very important. Do you know what's another name for the divine praises? An act of reparation for profane speech. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get this, folks. We're getting ready for Lent. 
Next time you use profane speech, why don't you make yourself do the 14 divine praises? Let me tell you, it's not worth it, <laughs> okay, right? You know, you start saying the divine praises every time you use profane speech, after 14 declarations, you're like, you know, I'm never going to use profanity again, right? The divine praises are also very important when there is blasphemous speech. So if you use the Lord's name in vain, you can pray the 14 divine praises to show the Lord that you repent of using his name in a sacrilegious or blasphemous manner, right? So this is also part of our tradition. So if you ever come to confession and the priest says, pray the divine praises, you're like, I don't know what those are. Now you know. You turn to page 47 and there you go. And you don't tell anyone that that was your penance because then they'll know what you might have possibly did, right? You know? It's like, oh, you got a dirty mouth. How'd you know that, right? Uh huh. That's why the church says we should not disclose our penance to other people. All right? So watch out, you know? Okay, so let's look at those divine praises. I'm going to start them and I want us to say them all together. Ready? Blessed be God. Okay, well, there are, those are the 14 divine praises. So now if you hear someone reference the divine praises or the act of reparation for profane speech, you now know what they're talking about. So as you're saying and praying the divine praises, the priest or deacon is putting the blessed sacrament back in the tabernacle, and then he's walking back. And when he gets to the step, after the divine praises, he genuflects. Now, he's doing that because God's there, right? But he's also genuflecting because that's your cue to stand up, right? So the genuflection of the priest or deacon, you stand up and then Catholic signature hymn, Holy God, we praise thy name, right? So then we start singing, Holy God, we praise thy name. And that's the beautiful practice of adoration. Isn't that great? So next week we don't meet. Then on the following week, uh, February 15th, we're going to review it one more time, Okay. And then on the 22nd of February, we don't have se a session because it's Ash Wednesday. So the following week, February 29th, guess what? We're going to do it all together, folks. We're going to actually have adoration as a group. We'll just have about maybe five minutes of adoration. We're going to walk through this whole thing. You guys excited? I'm very excited about it, right? So we've been working on this the whole time, step by step by step by step. All right. Let's see. High schoolers, go and stand up. Give the Lord a bow. You can head to class. Thank you. <coughs> Second and third graders, go and stand up. Give the Lord a bow. You can head to class. Thank you. All right, middle schoolers, go and stand up. You can give the Lord a bow. And you can head to class. So let's see, the fourth and fifth graders, let me ask you, how many commandments are there? Go ahead, everyone. How many sacraments are there? Wow, okay, okay. How many gospel books are there in the New Testament? Four, how many? You guys are doing very well. How many commandments? Nice and loud for the deaf people. How many? How many sacraments? How many gospel books? Four. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, one of your classmates, Leo, there received his first Holy Communion this past Sunday. Congratulations, Leo. <laughs> and Miss Joan's been away for a couple weeks. She's back with us. Welcome back, Joan. All right, children, you can stand up, give the Lord a bow. 
And you can head to class. God bless you. All right, adults, you can fill in however you prefer. All right, so adults, let's get our brains moving here. Uh, what does the word Bible mean? And how many books are in the Bible? And we talk about a book of the Bible. We're talking about a Russian novel, right? No, in fact, many of the books of the Bible, it's almost laughable to call them books. Some of them are a page or three pages. The majority, actually, are very brief. So sometimes we hear book and chapter and we get a little nervous, especially if we're not normal Bible readers. It's like, what? What, that has five chapters? It's like, yeah, it's four pages, right? Because chapters in the Bible are smaller than we might think of. Books in the Bible aren't books like Russian novels. Very different. How many books? And the best way for me to read the Bible is to start at the very beginning and just read it all the way through to the end, right? Is that how the Bible was designed to be read? No, 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 exactly. It'd be like me walking into a library, going to the shelf of new books, and thinking I can start at the first book, read all the books, and that they're going to form one unified message like I might find in a novel. Is that true of the Bible? No. No. There's a unified message in terms of God is speaking to us. There's one plan of salvation, but there's 73 different books, different times of history, different emphases, different literary genres. Everything is different. And even the way in which we are meant to approach the scriptures is different. So there's a strategy, a plan, a method, right? So how many books are in the Old Testament? How many are in the New Testament? Wow, okay, okay. And do all Catholics and Protestants agree on the number of books in the Bible? Do we all agree on the New Testament? Thanks be to God. Do we all agree on the Old Testament? How many books are in disagreement? Seven. Seven. And our Protestant neighbors will call them the Apocrypha. Would we call them that? No. And if our Protestant neighbors call them that, what should we do? Make fun of them. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, no, no. Perhaps explain them that actually that term is offensive to Catholics, right? Apocrypha means what? False teaching. We would call them instead what? The Deuterocanonicals. So it means the later or the second list. And how many Deuterocanonicals are there? Are they span, do they span all throughout the Old Testament? No. Yes. yes, yes. Three of the four sections, exactly, right? So they're all throughout. They're not just found in one section, right? So with that, let me ask, I just told you, let's see. How many parts are there in the Old Testament? Four. What's the first one? How many books are in the Pentateuch? Do all Catholics and Protestants agree on those five? Yeah, thanks be to God. It's the only part of the Old Testament we agree on, right? That's pretty good. And that's very important because that's the heart of the Old Testament. That's the main part. So it's good. Okay, great. Thanks be to God. What's the second part of the Old Testament? The historical books, exactly. Do we agree on all the historical books? No. No. How many historical books are there? Exactly. How many deuterocanonicals are there? Four. Four of them, exactly. Most of the deuterocanonicals are found in the historical books. Let's see if we remember them. What's the first one? What's the second one? Talk about a lead in. What's the first one? What's the second one? Huh? Right? Exactly. What's the third one? So I love the story of Tobit. Young kid, on his way, trying to help his dad out. Angels gardening him. He finds a wife along the way. That could be a great movie, right? Okay, what's the fourth one? Judith, Judith, exactly. You know how much I think of Judith. So, historical books. What's the third part of the Old Testament? Wisdom. Wisdom. How many books in wisdom? How many deuterocanonicals? Two. Two. What's the first one? Again, these lead-ins are just overwhelming, right? What's the second one? Sirach. And that's actually his name. If you think, what kind of, Sirach? That's actually his name. I know that probably doesn't help. You're like, that's still weird. Talk to his mama. Okay, right? <laughs> What's the fourth part? Prophetic. prophetic books. How many books are in the prophetic books? How many Deuterocanonicals? One. We were so close. We were so close to a unanimous agreement, right? One book. One book, right? And what's that book? Baruch. Baruch the second sequel to what prophet? Jeremiah. Exactly. All right. So um, how many books in the Bible again? How many in the Old Testament? How many in the New Testament? Exactly. How many epochs are there in salvation history? And if I was going to read the book, the Bible strategically, I would want to read what books? 
the what? So I should read the supplemental books? The supplemental books? No, how much? The narrative books, say it again. You know what you're doing, be bold, huh? Be bold, be Catholic, huh? So what books? The supplemental books? No, not at first. Eventually we should read them. They're the word of God, right? But if we want to just approach the Bible and we want to do it strategically and read the Bible the way it was meant to be read, we want to start with the what? The narrative narrative books. And there are how many narrative books? Uh Aha, aha. Very good. And the 14 narrative books parallel, there's going to be some variations, but they parallel the 12 epochs of salvation history, right? The reason why there's 14 narrative books but 12 epochs is, well, some of these epochs need a little more explanation. Some of, them, some of them need more development, right? So I mentioned the narrative books. How many again? So the 59 supplemental books, that's just garbage? No, no still the Word of God, right? Yes. Should we eventually read them? Yes, yes all of them except Leviticus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, eventually we have to put on our big people pants and read Leviticus too, right? So eventually we should try to read the whole of the scriptures. So if you have not yet read the narrative books, I want to really encourage you with that. Our Bible study is based on the narrative books. I know it's easy to forget that because it's taken us two years to get through Genesis, right? But I'm very excited in the fall launching into Exodus, right? So exactly, and then that takes another two years, okay? No, your kids will be graduated from college before we even finish or get near to finishing, right? But it's okay, we're taking our time, we're not in a hurry. So if you have not read the 14 narrative books, that's a great start. So I want to encourage you with that. If you've read the 14 narrative books, then maybe you can go back and start to read the supplemental books. You start making your way through them. And then the goal eventually is to have read the entire scriptures. And does it end there? No. Even then, you're really just getting started. Because then after that, you pick maybe a book where you really specialize. So you get commentaries and maps and just go all out, right? So you dive into it. You find the book that really kind of resonated with you. Like, I really like that Obadiah, you know? So it's like, wow, you know, I didn't hear anything until I read Habakkuk, right? You know what I mean? It's like, that's just said it for me, you know? It's like, wow, like Nehemiah and so on, right? This is where you know you've reached full Bible geekdom, huh? <laughs> and actually, I'm joking. That's really where we need to be, right? We want to get there. So what's our first step? We want to read the what books? Then we want to eventually read the whole Bible, which means we read the what books? And then we specialize in a book. And then if we do that, then we move on to another one, to another one, and so on, right? And eventually, we actually have a working knowledge of the scriptures. So far, so good? Good. How many epochs of salvation history are contained in the book of Genesis? So, so far, I granted it's taken us two years. It will have taken us two years to get to the book of Genesis. But when we're done, in early May, we would have finished two epochs of salvation history. The first is early world, and the second is what? That's pretty huge. Again, folks, there's only 12. In early May, we're going to be done with two. That's two of 12. That's called progress, right? So I'm really excited about that. All right, how many patriarchs, and again, catechetically, we're just giving ourselves bullet points. How many patriarchs are there? This is a four main part patriarchs. Exactly. What's the first one? The second. The third. Jacob's renamed what? And Israel has how many sons? And the fourth patriarch? Exactly. Good, good, good. And that just helps us step by step by step by step. Okay. As we start to look to the fall, we know that the third epoch of salvation history is contained in the book of Exodus. And Exodus is the second narrative book. It's also the second book of the Bible. Genesis is the first, Exodus is the second. This is great. So far, so good. The third epoch is freedom from Egypt. You could say freedom from slavery. But sometimes we try to get Egypt in there. It's a huge part of salvation history. So freedom from Egypt. What is it? Freedom from Egypt. Now, there are other ways you can say I try to simplify this. It took me all week thinking about this. Like, what can I say? Maybe liberation from slavery in Egypt. That's not, that, that doesn't have the buzz, does it, right? So I'm thinking, how can we simplify this? I thought, freedom from Egypt. That's simple enough, right? But I want you to know there's a lot there. I'm simplifying it, right? What's the third epoch of salvation history? Freedom. Freedom what was the first one? 
Yeah, see, I got you. I kept, 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 kept. That's good. You all said it right. Exactly. Not that other term, but you got this one, right? What's the first one? The second? The third? There you go. And we're going to keep walking through this. And while we do this formally as a group, I want to encourage you at home to be studying the sacred scriptures. It's a divine word, a living word. Every time we read the Bible, God speaks to us. So far, so good? All right, so good. Let's go ahead and go to the book of Genesis. And tonight's going to be an emotional night because Joseph, Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brothers. And there's going to be some back and forth that's going to be just very heartwarming. Before diving into chapter 45, let's do some quick review. Chapter 38 is really the backbone of everything we've been doing. Chapter 38 tells us 20 years of history of Judah. And we see that Judah was a questionable character. His brothers feared him. He was the one who proposed that they sell Joseph into slavery. We see his brutality, his lust. So chapter 38, we see Judah's life. That's the parallel chapters 39, 40, and 41, which is the early life and the rising of Joseph. And we compare, contrast Judah to Joseph. Then 42 to 44 was Joseph and his family, that whole interaction, which we concluded last week. Now we start chapter 45, and this is the big crescendo. We're going to see the third cry of Joseph. And we told you there are three, we went over that there are three major cries of Joseph, right? We've already seen two of them. Today we're going to see, this evening we're going to see that third one, right? And this is the culmination. So all of these chapters from chapter 37 on, from the time Joseph is sold into slavery, is leading and culminating here in chapter 45. And again, as we have walked through this, I hope that you have felt some of that drama, right? The back and forth, the games Joseph's playing, the stage that he's setting, the test that he's posing to his brothers and to Judah. That speech last week from Judah, Wow, that's a different man, right? And now we get to see Joseph's response. So far, so good? Okay, good. Let's go to chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, make everyone go out from me. So he is reacting to Judah's speech. So remember, Judah drew close to him gave this whole summary, and basically there in 44, chapter 44, verse 33, said, I'll, I'll take the boy's place. I'll take Benjamin's place. Right. And now Joseph is reacting, and he can't control himself, and now he's telling everyone, get out of the room. This is going to be family time. So all of his assistants, all of his courtiers, the guards, everyone out of the room. Right. This is going to be Joseph with his brothers. And then it continues. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. So again, this is Joseph and his brothers. Verse 2. And he wept aloud. So there's the third cry of Joseph. So you can imagine he knows this is not going to be good. He doesn't want the Egyptians present. So he tells everyone to get out. right? Because he wants to just be with his brothers. Now, we know there at verse 2, he's starting to weep. So you can only imagine what his voice sounded like as he was telling the guards to leave. Have you ever been on the verge of a cry and you're trying to hold it in? <laughs> right? It's like the awkward, you sound like a Martian in, in like pain, right? Because your voice just isn't, you know, cooperating. So we can only imagine here what Joseph is doing. He said, get out, get out, guys. He wants to clear the room quickly because, verse 2, and he wept aloud, so the Egyptians heard it, and get this, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. How loud was that man crying? Right? Now, Pharaoh would have been in the vicinity, and again, they would have been open, so there wouldn't have had windows, so things would have been wide open, and so definitely sound would have carried. But the level and the depth of Joseph's crying we are told even Pharaoh's house heard it. So later here in verse 45, we're going to hear that Pharaoh is told that Joseph's brothers have come. Well, 
we almost have to hear that because everyone's hearing the second most powerful man crying and wailing. Like, what's he crying about? What's going on? Right? So verse 3. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Now in Hebrew, that's only two words. And it's two of the most powerful words in the book of Genesis. So I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Now, in the Hebrew, this is actually the more familial word than father. So if we were to translate it literally, he asks, is my dad still alive? Right. So it's more familiar. Now, remember we've spoken about with chapters 42 to 45 that we watch the language in terms of family? Well, that does roll over to chapter 45 because what does he say here? Is he saying, our father? No. There'll come a place for that. He's saying, my dad. Right? I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Is my dad still alive? Right. So, first of all, you can just imagine the shock. Like, what? Because at this point, there's no translation. Everyone's gone. He is now, for the first time, speaking to his brothers in their native language, in Hebrew. So you can imagine just the shock that this official has been able to understand everything. He's speaking their language, and he's disclosing himself as their brother that they sold into slavery. And of course, Joseph immediately goes to his dad. Is, is my dad still alive? Now this shows that he doesn't have a 100% trust factor with his brothers, does he? Because they've already told him that their father is alive, right? So after he discloses himself, his first concern is his father. Okay, it continues. But his brothers could not answer him. <laughs> I bet, right? I bet. First of all, they were probably completely, thoroughly confused. And they're probably immediately inflicted with great fear, because so far, I am Joseph, is my dad still alive? He is, it appears, removing himself from any type of association or relationship with these men who think or consider themselves his brother. And so they can't answer. They don't know what to do. It continues. For they were dismayed at his presence. Now, it has the power in English. In Hebrew, it's even more so. They couldn't imagine that he's standing there. His presence shocked them. And we can understand that in English as well, that they were shocked. They were dismayed at his presence. Who is this? Right? It would be a shocking if you would have a love member, a, family of, of your, a member of your family, a loved one, have died, and you walk out to get in your car tonight, and that person's standing by your car. Right? Shocked and dismayed at their presence. We thought you were dead. Oh yeah, we were the ones that sold you into slavery. We were the ones that were so jealous of you. And we were the ones that wanted you destroyed. And now you're the second most powerful man after Pharaoh himself. They were dismayed at his presence. Completely shocked. Verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers... Come near to me, I beg you. Oh, huh. yeah. Now, there's two ways of interpreting this. One is, he wants to, remember at this point, other than Judah, in the previous chapter, the brothers have never been close to him. Remember, they even ate at a separate table. So one interpretation is, he said, come close, because once they were closer, they could realize that's our brother. Right? The other interpretation is he's telling them to come near because there was, I am Joseph, is my father, my dad's still alive, and now come near to me. So it's the invitation, it's the beginning of the warming up. Right? Come near to me. And as the second, the viceroy of Egypt, no one approached him without permission. 
That's why in chapter 44, when Judah's like, what do I have to lose? And he approaches Joseph without permission. That was very bold. Here, Joseph is saying, come to me. Come closer. Right. And what do we see? Uh, verse 4b. And they came near. I'd love to see how they approached him, right? It was probably like this, like, okay, okay. Where's Benjamin? Put him up front. <laughs> okay, right? yeah, I mean, like, yeah. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Because we know how this is going to conclude. Do they? No, and right now, he's not really giving a lot. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, just watch, look at that, and go back up to verse 3. And Joseph said to his brothers, this is the narrative, what is he saying? I am Joseph. Is my dad still alive? Look there now at verse 4. I am your brother Joseph. Does that change things? Oh, yeah, right? I am Joseph. Is my dad still alive? Very removed. I am your brother, Joseph. Right. You see the difference? But then, of course, you can imagine there's a little bit of consolation, but then what comes next? <laughs> Whom you sold into Egypt. It's like, so close. <laughs> it's so close, right? <laughs> So now they can imagine they're wondering, is this affection or is this more of a setup? What's coming next? Verse 5. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. So, oh, okay, now we're seeing he is being brother. Right? Don't be distressed. Don't be upset with yourself. Don't be anxious. So, don't worry. Because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Wow. So Joseph is looking at something far beyond his own hurt, his own harm, his own emotions. There's no self-pity in this man, is there? Don't be worried and anxious because you sold me here in slavery, for God did this so that I might preserve life. And notice the universal application there. It's not just the life of Israel. It's not just the life of the Egyptians, it's life. Because we were told previously in the sacred narrative, the whole world turned to Egypt for food. And who fed them? Joseph. And Joseph is saying, don't worry about what you did. For God sent me here in order to preserve life. So he's looking at the mission, the purpose. What came forth from this? Was there hardship? Was there betrayal? Yes, yes. Is that what's going to define the future or what we're moving forward with? No. For Joseph to look and say, it wasn't easy. Yeah, you broke my heart. You betrayed me. I was away from my father, away from my family. But God sent me here in order to preserve life. Joseph could see something greater than his own hurt and harm. Can we learn from that? My goodness, Tim Grace, we in the West right now thrive on self-pity. Like we have whole movies and talk shows and marketing who, you shouldn't be treated like that. Who do they think you are? But fueling the anger, fueling the entitlement, fueling the self-pity. It's like, wait a minute, back up. Yeah, that was wrong. That was hurtful. But, you know, look what's come from it. Look at the good that has been born from it. This is the vision of Joseph. Joseph is looking from the perspective of God. Remember, he told everyone, I received my interpretation of genes from God. God is the one who gives me the answer. He's in front of Pharaoh early on in the sacred narrative, and he's given testimony to Pharaoh, speaking in the singular, speaking of God. He even has Pharaoh starting to refer to God in the singular. The Egyptians were polytheists. They worshipped multiple gods. Pharaoh, to some, was a god himself. And yet Joseph, because of his testimony, is converting the hearts of many. And Joseph, is, and Joseph here is pointing out, God sent me before you in order to preserve life. But wait, oh, it gets better. Watch this. Verse 6. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there have been neither plowing nor harvest. It's been bad. It's been really bad. But God sent Joseph to prepare. 
to preserve life. Verse 7, and God sent me before you. That powerful. The whole time you think it's the brothers, right? The brothers are the ones who threw him in the well. The brothers are the ones who sold him into slavery. It was the Ishmaelites who dragged him to Egypt. It was the Egyptian authorities that held him captive. And Joseph said, no, 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 no. All that happened, but God was the one who sent me before this. I was above all of this the entire time, for this was God's plan. Now, I think the more as believers we retrieve this, the more we can abandon the falsity that we find in the unbeliever. Because we find the unbeliever, there's the self-pity, the entitlement, the anger, the bitterness. You know, you ever find someone they're still complaining about something that happened 25, 40 years ago? It's like, get over it. Your past does not determine your present. And you can look at all the things that God has done that would not have happened if these evil things had not been permitted. And that's our understanding as believers. At least it's supposed to be. That's definitely the perspective of Joseph. He's not justifying the evil of his brothers. He's not saying, eh, it was okay, I'm glad you did that to me. He's not diminishing the hurt that was caused. He's asking about his dad because he misses him. He had to grow up without him. But he's looking above. He said, God sent me before all that. Huh? The next time you want to lick your wounds and fall into self-pity, just tell yourself, God has sent me before this. Huh? I am before this. Joseph continues, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. And what does that language tell us? Remnant? Survivors? Was this a horrific famine? Yeah, a lot of people have died. A lot of people died. Right? We don't have specifics, but Joseph is describing to us how severe this famine was. Verse 8, so it was not you who sent me here. <laughs> you imagine his brothers listening to this? It wasn't you who sent me here. You can imagine Judah's like, I'm really glad he's saying that. <laughs> right? Remember Judah, of course, being the one who sold him into slavery. Right? I'm glad he's saying that. Right? It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Wow. Remember those two dreams of that 17-year-old Joseph? He was ambitious and arrogant, but those dreams came true. God was preparing his heart in order to accomplish this task. Notice there, a father to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is his elder. Pharaoh was a 40-something-year-old man at this point. Joseph when he first started, he began to speak to Pharaoh and is in his mid-30s or so. He's younger. And he's a Hebrew foreigner, and he was a slave. And now look at this language, that I have been made a father to Pharaoh. Now there we could say it could be interpreted as a counselor or as an authority to the Pharaoh and so on, but definitely some familial terms. Remember, we're trying to watch the familial terms and the shifts that we see in this, right? So Joseph said, I have become a father to Pharaoh and a lord of his house and ruler of the land of Egypt. And all this occurred because of what you've done. Okay, verse 9. Make haste and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not, tar do not tarry, tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. And you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. So again, after saying and giving this powerful testimony of God's providence, God's work, Joseph's heart goes back to his father. He says, now, don't be, don't be hesitant. Don't be slow. Go and tell dad that his servant wants him to come. Right? Tell him to come to Egypt. Verse 11, and there I provide for you. Oh, and by the way, he promises them Goshen. <laughs> Goshen is like the best of the best of the land of Egypt, right? The most fertile, the most abundant. In fact, later in salvation history, it's one of the reasons why a later Pharaoh is so angry but at these Hebrew foreigners that they have the best of his land. 
But Joseph says, you go tell dad to come, and he will dwell in Goshen. And that would have been something everybody would have recognized, right? So I was like, Goshen? What? Like, that's, that's the best. Exactly. Right. I'm trying to think of Monopoly. Is it Park Place? Is that the big boardwalk? Park Place? Yeah, exactly. You know, that would have been Goshen, right? It's like, what? Okay. Verse 11. And there I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. So we know that the famine is going to continue. Joseph tells us five more years. He says, go get dad, tell him to come. We'll be in Goshen. Everything will be taken care of. No one will suffer. Verse 12. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. Now again, this is the first time he's spoken to them in Hebrew. So there's a literal application there, but also he is speaking to them. So this is his heart speaking to them. And of course, he identifies Benjamin. Benjamin is his only full brother. Both Benjamin and Joseph were the only sons of Rachel, the beloved wife of Jacob Israel. Right. Okay. Verse 13. You must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Make haste and bring my father down here. Right. So you can imagine that's kind of Joseph saying, and, and kind of, you know, Tell dad how successful I've been. <laughs> you know I mean? like, tell, dad, tell dad if I've done well. Right? Yeah. But he's saying, bring him, he can trust, and, and come, you know, and so on. Okay. Verse 14. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Right? This is the first time, and the only time in this narrative, that we hear anything about the interiority of Benjamin. This is a major player, a huge person in this narrative. This is the first time we've heard anything about Benjamin. He doesn't say anything. And this is the only time we see his interiority. And what is he doing? He's crying with his brother Joseph. Right? So remember, he was three or five. So Joseph would have been someone he'd only heard of right? as an older brother who had this tragic death with, by these wild animals, you know. And there's Joseph standing in front of him, right? So it's like, what? You know. So they embrace, and they begin to cry. Verse 15, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and after that, his brothers talked with him. Did you catch that? So he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and then, and then, the, okay, everything's good, right? You know? Then they began to talk to him. So up, in this, this, up until this point, they're still kind of hesitant. They're not sure what he's going to do. He's speaking words of wisdom and words of compassion, words of providence and wisdom and so on, divine wisdom. But they're still not sure. It's only when he embraces them and kisses them that they begin to say, oh, okay, and they begin to talk. Now, something we didn't mention uh, previously with Judah's speech was that when, ben, when um, Joseph gave Benjamin five times the portion of the other brothers, there's a really interesting uh, Jewish interpretation of that that says that Joseph was trying to make the brothers jealous. And then to see what would happen when their jealousy was provoked. Right? So five portions the night before, right from Pharaoh's viceroy's table. Right? And then the next day, they find a silver cup in Benjamin's sack, right? So it would have been easy for the brothers to say, we never liked that kid in the first place. You know, we got rid of his brother, now we can get rid of him, right? So even that was kind of a setting the stage where Joseph is saying, let's see how much they really have changed. And of course we see that they had changed, Judah had changed, he's willing to take his place, take Benjamin's place. Here they're exchanging, Joseph is now definitely fraternal, he's showing his affection for them, and then now they begin to speak to him. Verse 16. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. They're probably like, oh, good. That's why he was crying. <laughs> I was afraid it was because we were out of grain. <laughs> you know I mean? Verse 17. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. So the fat there is the best, the choicest. Verse 19, 
Command them also, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Give no thought to your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Is Pharaoh grateful? Yeah. Pharaoh knows what Joseph has done for him. And Pharaoh's brothers are here. His his family have arrived. They are going to receive the best of care. So this is from Pharaoh's own mouth. Verse 21. The sons of Israel, again, notice any time we see relationship, is he being called Jacob? No, it's Israel now. And this will shift. The sons of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. Verse 22. To each and all of them he gave festal garments. But to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five festal garments. Is that poetic justice? What started this whole thing? That coat of many colors, didn't it? Right? Jacob gave Joseph that coat of many colors. That's what started all this. That's what provoked the jealousy of his brothers. And here, Joseph gives them all festal garments, but he gives more to Benjamin. And he gives Benjamin silver. What did the Ishmaelites pay the brothers when they took Joseph into slavery? Silver. So you can see the poetic justice here. Verse 23. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, and ten she-donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Verse 24. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the way. (laughs) Does does he know his brothers? He's like, now y'all get along, okay? Right? Stop fighting. Verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. So whenever we hear about them going up, so they would have been traveling, of course, north. And the journey from Egypt to the Holy Land, to the land of Canaan, would have been between three to five days. Now, that's important for us in the fall, when we get to the book of Exodus. They were roaming around the desert for how long? 40 years. 40. It's a five-day journey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a five day so this back and forth between Jacob and, his, and, and, and the brothers of Joseph and so on, back and forth, back and forth, thinking, what? It's only a three to five day journey, right? Okay, so Joseph now is loading them up. He's giving them extra for the father, for Jacob on, on the return trip. Verse uh, 26, and they, told, and they told him, excuse me, um, so they went up out of Egypt uh, and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob, verse 26, and they told him, here's one of the big moments, Joseph is still alive. What do you think happened to that old man when he heard that? <laughs> Whew, shocked. You know, Joseph is still alive. That's the first thing. It's like, what? I thought you guys told me he was attacked by wild beasts. So Joseph is still alive. And then, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what? Not only is he alive, but the boy's done well. Okay? And we are told, and his heart fainted. So it's even worse in Hebrew. In fact, it can't be translated. His heart was crushed. Yeah, you can't even translate it. Like, Hebrew is not an emotional language at all. And when it tries to be emotional, it goes way over the top. It makes up for what was lacking, right? So here in English, it says, his heart fainted. Okay. For he did not believe them. So it's like, is this some type of game? Like, is is this funny to you? First to say that my dead son is alive and then that he is the ruler of Egypt? Doesn't believe it. But wait. Verse 27. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons, because remember, Jacob's a smart man, right? He's always been a good businessman. Remember when he was wheeling and dealing with his father-in-law Laban? He knows it. He's like, is this some type of game? Looks at the wagon, he's like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> right? He's like, you guys, 
okay, this is, this is looking pretty good. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Because again, it's, his spirit was fainted. It was just non-existent. It was like vapor. Right? And then all of a sudden he sees, and it sounds credible. It looks credible. And so his spirit is revived. And Israel said, again, now we're using his God-given name, and Israel said, it is enough. So in Hebrew, we have it, or it has happened, right? When I first was reading the uh, Hebrew interpretation of this, some of you know I went to seminary in Rome, and the Italians have this great expression called basta. It's great. So whenever like, someone's like, oh my God, oh, basta, basta, right? You're just like, you can't control it anymore. It's like, basta, right? You know, it's like, not pasta, that's something else. <laughs> with a B, with a B, basta, right? Basta, basta, oh yes, basta, basta, like, basta così, right? You know, it's like, they're overwhelmed, they can't express it anymore. If you find an Italian that can't express something, you know they've reached a certain level, right? Right? So that's what I thought of in terms of this, when Joe says, it is enough. Like, he's just, he can't, he can't express himself anymore. It, it, it's, it's too much. It's, all, it's everything. It's fulfilled. It, it's, it's, it, it's divine. Right? It's God, right? So it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. That's it. That's why it's enough, right? My son, Joseph, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Powerful. And we can't miss what Jacob Israel is doing. The reason why we hear the divine given name is he was named Israel because he received the inheritance of Abraham. He's been given the promised land. He is the patriarch, the guardian, the custodian of the land given by God to Abraham. And now, in uncertainty, God's providence is calling him to leave the land of Abraham. Only the love of a son for a son could have moved him to do that. In fact, we're going to see later when he says, okay, look, I'm going to go. But when we come back, because he always knew God would call them back to Canaan. When we come back, you make sure you bring my bones with you. And powerfully, we're going to see this later in Genesis. Then we get to Exodus. 400 years later, guess what the Israelites still have? The bones of Jacob. I love to point this out to biblical Christians when they want to mock our relics. You got bone fragments in your house of worship? Yeah, we do. Yeah, not the bones of Jacob, I wish, right? But here's some of the biblical evidence that we're not worried about this stuff. And the bones of holy ones are means by, by which we can encounter God. So Jacob is going to say, okay, I'm going to go because he wants to see Joseph. He doesn't understand why God is calling him out of the land of Canaan. But he has confidence that God's going to call him back. And he says, you make sure you bring my bones back and you bury, you bury my bones with my forebears, with my forefathers. That's an important lesson for us because there are times in our own lives when God will call us outside of what we thought he wanted. Like they say, God writes straight with crooked lines. Huh? Look at the life of Joseph. This was not an easy life. At any point, Joseph could have said, you know what, I'm just going to turn to a life of crime and violence. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Ten years he was in prison. Ten years. Every morning that man had to wake up and try to understand what God was doing. And now Jacob is being called out of the land of Abraham. And he's going to go because his son Joseph is alive. It is enough. It is enough. I don't know what God is doing. I don't know why he's calling us to Egypt. Egypt is always the land of evil and regression. I don't know why he's doing this. But it is enough. God has called, he has summoned, and I will go. Again, it's a powerful lesson there for all of us. Maybe we're in a particular job and we say, God's wanting us over here. It's like, oh no. Maybe we're at a certain level of income and God says, you can be kinder to the poor. Drop it down a little bit. Oh no. 
Maybe God's saying, I want you to forgive this person. Joseph is like the witness to mercy, right? I want you to forgive this person. You have to leave the world of your own hatred and your own self-pity and show mercy. God's constantly calling us out of places of comfort, even when we think, okay, no, this is his land. This is where he's given his land. This is where he wants us. And he says, okay, yeah, no, you have to leave. You imagine saying to God, no, no, we're not going to listen to you because this is where you told us to be. <laughs> it's kind of like when you learn to get your driver's license and you have the street lights. But if there's a police officer, who do you listen to? The police officer. You all know that, right? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> like, who's driving home tonight? Okay. <laughs> Same. We can't say to the police officer, I'm not going to listen to you. The light says, but, you know. So here Jacob's like, Okay. We're going to hear more about this because he's wrestling with this. I have to leave the land of Abraham. This entire narrative has been when God called Abraham from Ur to this promised land. And now it appears that God is calling his people out of the promised land and to Egypt. Remember Abraham? Abraham went to Egypt in his darkest hour, Abraham went to Egypt when he was regressing, when he was not trusting God. Abraham, in, excuse me, Egypt in salvation history is always synonymous with great evil. And God is sending his patriarch, Jacob Israel, and his people into the land of Egypt. And again, the only thing that would have compelled him to go was the love of a son. And a son that he thought was already dead and a son that he greatly favored, and the son that he desperately wanted to see before he died. Isn't this good stuff? Like, why do people watch movies when you could read this kind of stuff, right? And why doesn't Hollywood make something that's worthwhile instead of all the garbage they give us, huh? This is true and life-giving, inspiring. Right? And we're going to pick that up in two weeks, um, verse uh, 40, uh, chapter 46. Talk about leaving you in suspense, huh? But get this, you can go and read chapter 46. You don't have to wait for me. <laughs> but we're going to walk through it together in two weeks. All right, we have a few minutes. Uh, questions, comments, clarifications? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so at this point it could be that there's nonverbal communication. So the question was, the brothers never really answer Joseph's question about whether his father's alive. It's possible that there was nonverbal communication that's not contained in the narrative, or Joseph just presumed that his father was still alive. That's what he'd been told at first. And because the brothers did not immediately come back and say, well, no, no, we're, we're sorry, like, no, our father has died, and so on. The fact there was no immediate reply led Joseph to believe he's still alive and here's what we're going to do. And of course, if he had passed, his brothers could have said, no, actually, we can't do that. Like, our father is truly dead. Right? So either it was presumption or nonverbal communication or both. So, but thank you. Good. Yep, Bob? You know where it says, because of the love of the son, right? Mm hmm And it's, it's that, like the foreshadowing. It's so awesome to see. That's like the foreshadowing of Christ. Oh, absolutely. I mean, exactly. The, the, exactly. The early fathers of the church... Um, Bob's just making the parallels between Joseph and the Lord, Lord Jesus. And, and the early fathers of our faith had a field day. Parallels between Christ and Judah, parallels between Christ and Joseph, the love of, J of Jacob, Israel, for, um, uh, for Joseph and, and leaving this land of promise in order to enter the land of darkness. Does that sound familiar? Right? You know, so very much the early fathers saw parallels. In fact, when you read some of their uh, homilies and stuff, uh, it's almost, it almost gets you dizzy because it's like, and this, and this, and this. They saw hundreds and hundreds of parallels between the Lord Jesus, Judah, um, Joseph, uh, Jacob, Israel, and so on. You know? By the way, I have to tell you, the early fathers, we have all their homilies. They would preach for hours, right? And they didn't write them down. Do you know how we have their homilies? People listened and remembered them and later went home and wrote them down, right? That's how we have their homilies, right? So the next time you complain about 24 minutes, 
It could be worse. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Andy says, so many times you, oh, I get interesting emails all the time about the length of the homilies. That's okay. You know, it's like strong. Duro. So, good. Thank you, Bob. Yes, Mel. Yeah. I, I'd just be waiting for the other shooters to drop. Absolutely. I mean, I'd be like, the guilt would be killing me. Like, oh my God, what is he going to do to me? Yeah. Us? Yeah, Mel was saying that if he was one of the brothers standing there, just the, the, the shock, the guilt of, of what is he going to do, what's going to happen, and so on. And, and the sacred narrative wants us to feel that because, you know, they kind of like ease us in. Like, we know how the story concludes, but if we didn't and we were just watching it versus, I am Joseph, how is my dad doing? Right? And they make us wait to, for him to say, I am your brother, Joseph, right? And then there's this beautiful display of God's providence. That comes a little bit later. And only then does he go and then embrace them and kiss them, right? So the whole time you can imagine the brothers are like, is he just softening things up for the punch, right? You know what's going on? Because it's not until he embraces them and cries with them that they begin to speak to him, right? So they begin to speak, right? So yeah, the whole time, I think the sacred narrative wants us to feel that drama, right? That, that anticipation, you know? Because yeah, remember, these were orally given, right? These were, this was an oral tradition, right? So you can imagine, like, people, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, little children of the covenant, like, then what happened? Well, we have to wait till next week, <laughs> right? So, and again, you can look at the sacred narrative, and then you see, and now, and behold, these are in there because they were orally given, right? So this is how they were passed on, and so this dramatic uh, you know, increase in this crescendo was in, in part to keep the attention of the listeners. You know, so. Yes, um, yes, go ahead, Jamie. Yes. Very much. Absolutely. Jamie says that, you know, when, when Jacob says it is enough, you know, uh, it's almost as if like God, God is enough that, that, you know, very much like God has fulfilled this, God has, has, has brought this together and so on. Um, that Hebrew, in Hebrew, it's, it's actually just one word and it's one of those words that you can't really translate. You just have to try to give expression. It is enough. So I, I Mentioned like in Italian, it's is the basta, basta così. It's just like it's, it's too much. It's, it's overwhelming. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's God, right? It's, you know, so it is enough. What's interesting is remember that the favored title for God by the patriarchs was El Shaddai, which is Almighty God, the all powerful God. So that is the title that God spoke to Jacob at um, through uh, at Bethel. So he's the El Shaddai, right? We're told later in the book of Exodus, we're going to get there, that El Shaddai was the name, the title given to the patriarchs. It was the patriarchal title. And remember, that was the name that Jacob Israel appeals to when he is sending his sons, the El Shaddai, the, the God Almighty, that the one who has protected me, who has spoken to me, who has blessed my family, that he will protect and keep my sons safe, right? El Shaddai. So it's very interesting that here, now to realize all his sons are alive, this death that he thought happened actually didn't happen. And you can imagine this, it is enough, the El Shaddai, right? The, the God Almighty, the one who rules all things, whose providence pervades all things, like he is here, right? Now, quick aside to that, you know in the Eucharistic prayer, the first Eucharistic prayer, which is the one we use here at Our Lady Grace, when we call, we're called to mind Abel and Abraham and Melchizedek, and so on, so on. Have you ever noticed that in that trilogy, when it concludes, it says, and we ask you, Almighty God, right? El Shaddai, right? So we, in the New Covenant, still invoke the, the title of the patriarchs. Abel, Abraham, Melchizedek, you, El Shaddai, receive these gifts, right? Receive us, right? So remember, the community that gave us the Eucharistic prayer in Rome was principally a Jewish Christian community. So there's a lot of Judaism in the first Eucharistic prayer. That's very powerful. So that's one of them. So next time you're at Mass and you hear, and we beg you, Almighty God, you can be thinking, El Shaddai, right? It is enough, right? So excellent. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, please, April. Sure.
Yes. Very much. Excellent. Excellent. So April's just saying in chapter 37, as a reminder, when Jacob hears about Joseph's dreams, he says, what, what will come of this? What is this going to, what is going to happen with this? Now fast forward here, chapter 45, Jacob is beginning to see what was being prophesied and what is going to actually happen. We're going to see that play out for the rest of this portion of Genesis. But very much we can see Jason, J- Jacob himself almost in this position of wonder of what's going to happen. So, question? Yes, the question is, I see that you have um, Rabbi Seth. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, man. Yes. Yes. I'm glad you see. You know, I, I've, I have not been using the rabbi um, for a while, and I did have a part that I wanted to read this evening. So, I'm glad you said that, April. So, in the few minutes we have left, let me read you what the rabbi says. So, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was a member of the House of Lords in England, was a politician, but also an Orthodox rabbi. And I never met him, but he's an intellectual mentor in terms of taking absolute truth, right and wrong, and presenting it in a pluralistic society. By the way, Jonathan Sachs, one of his intellectual mentors was Joseph Ratzinger. So he's like, that Ratzinger, he's got it together, you know? So, in fact, someone had a picture they posted of uh, Rabbi Sachs and um, Pope Benedict, and when they were visiting on one of the occasions, and they said, the, put, the, the caption read, um, I wonder what they're talking about in heaven. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, of course, if Rabbi Sachs got to heaven, he would have been shocked because Orthodox Jews don't believe in heaven. So, that probably would have been the first thing they talked about. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, all right. So, Rabbi Sachs, I just want to read this part. He writes, Joseph, in, a, in effect, recreates the past. Benjamin, like Joseph, is a son of Rachel and therefore likely to be envied and despised by the, old, the other brothers. The brothers' resentment of Joseph was heightened by the jealousy they felt at the sight of the many-colored robe Jacob had given him. Joseph therefore creates once again a situation of inequality. When he sits the, brother, when he sits the brothers down for a meal, he arranges that they be seated in order of age, highlighting the fact that Benjamin is the youngest and then ensures that Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. There is only one explanation for this strange detail. Joseph is trying to make his brothers jealous of their youngest sibling. As far as possible, the circumstances of their original crime have now been replicated. Their youngest brother, a child of Rachel, is about to be taken as a slave in Egypt. The brothers have reason to be jealous of him as they were of Joseph. This time, they rise to the challenge. As Benjamin is about to be taken into custody, his brothers offered offered to join him in prison. Joseph declines. Far be it for me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. The moment of trial has now begun. Joseph has offered the brothers a simple escape route. All they had to do was walk away. It is then that Judah went up to him and said that the story reaches its climax. Judah, the very brother who is responsible for selling Joseph into slavery, now offers to sacrifice his own freedom rather than let Benjamin be held as a slave. The circumstances are similar to what they were years earlier, but Judah's behavior is now diametrically opposed to what it was then. He has the opportunity and ability to repeat the offense, but he does not do so. Judah has fulfilled the conditions set out by the sages and Maimonides for perfect teshuva. As soon as he does so, Joseph reveals his identity and the drama is at an end. Now dreams, not revenge, but teshuva. Teshuva is like mercy, peace, reconciliation, is what has driven Joseph all along. His brothers once sold him as a slave. He survived. More than survived, he has prospered. He knows, he says so constantly, 
that everything that has happened to him is somewhat part of God's plan. His concern is not for himself, but for his brothers. Have they survived? Do they realize the depth of the crime that they have committed? Are they capable of remorse? Can they change? The entire sequence of events between the brothers' first arrival in Egypt and the moment Joseph reveals himself to them is an extended essay in Teshuvah, a precise rehearsal of what will later become normative Jewish law. And it must happen at this precise point because unbeknown to any of the participants, the family of Abraham is about to undergo exile in Egypt prior to their becoming a nation under the sovereignty of God. That will place more demands on Israel than on any other people in history. God knows that they will often fail. They will sin, complain, worship idols, break his laws. That he accepts, though at times it gives him great grief. God does not demand perfection. By giving us freedom, he empowers us to make mistakes. All he asks is that we acknowledge our mistakes and commit ourselves not to make them again. In a word, that we be capable of teshuva. Judah, by undergoing Joseph's test, demonstrated that the children of Israel have become true mercy, a true teshuva, masters of repentance, capable of learning from and growing through their mistakes. Jewish history, starting from exile and exodus in Egypt, could now begin. And there's more. I just gave you the highlights. He wrote a whole chapter just on Joseph. And I was trying to read along and try to give you some over the past couple of weeks, but he's not one you can just cut and paste. So I wanted to save that little piece for this part of our discussion of Joseph. He has more to say about Jacob and about leaving Canaan that we're going to get to in two weeks. Enjoy your week off. Boop, boop. I'll see you in two weeks. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.